This program is brought to you by Stanford University. Please visit us at stanford.edu. Good evening. Uh, my name is uh, David Stevenson. I'm the Vice Dean for the School of Medicine and Senior Dean for Academic Affairs. I'm also the Harold K. Faber Professor of Pediatrics and direct the uh, Center for Pregnancy and Newborn Services over at the Packard Children's Hospital. But my uh, pleasure this evening is to introduce one of my colleagues, and I'll do that in just a moment. I'd like to acknowledge that there are some people here wearing uh, clothing that looks like they're concerned about water. I was informed that there was an event uh, previously that involved sprinklers. I've been uh, reassured that that won't happen again, but th you know, you never can be absolutely certain, so I'm going to stay off to the side and let all of you take the brunt of that if it, uh, it happens. Um, I also would like to welcome you formally to the beginning of our uh, Stanford Summer Science Lecture Series. Uh, I'll introduce our first speaker in just a moment. We have some other speakers already arranged for you. Um, the next one is on uh, July uh, 12th, and uh, Bobby Robbins, who's a professor and chair of cardiothoracic surgery, will be speaking to us, and uh, this will be on a topic of recent advances in heart surgery. Should be very interesting. There's a lot going on in that field. On Thursday, July 26th, um, Craig Heller uh, from Biological Sciences uh, is going to give us a very interesting uh, talk on cool hands and better performance. This is the importance of temperature regulation as it relates to human performance, uh, well-being, and um, uh, in general, uh, how people can do better with temperature uh, controlled, in fact, in this case, cooling and the application to, I think, professional athletes and even athletes here at Stanford is going to be a very interesting discussion. There are other applications as well. And then the final one of the season will be by Russ Altman, the new professor and chair of bioengineering and professor of genetics and medicine, also by courtesy of com uh, computer science. And he'll be talking about drugs, one size does not fit all. This is the pharmacogenomics approach where individual individualized medicine becomes important. It'll be a very interesting topic. Uh, but this evening we have a a uh, very distinguished first speaker. It's my uh, colleague, Michael Longacre. He's a, an amazing scientist. Uh, he'll be speaking to us on a topic which should generate a lot of interesting questions from all of you. Um, Michael is the, um, the Dean P. and Louise Mitchell Professor in the Department of Surgery in the Division of Plastic and Reconstructive Surgery. Uh, he's also the director of uh, children's surgical, uh, children's research in um, the surgical laboratories. Uh, he directs also the regenerative medicine program and is the deputy director of our institute on um, uh, stem cell research and regenerative medicine. So he's right at the center of a lot that's uh, going on. Um, Michael is incredibly talented. He's authored over 800 original publications, which is really quite extraordinary, um, in, in uh, very fine uh, journals. He is the, um, uh, has been honored and awarded uh, many distinguished um, recognitions uh, nationally. The one that I think is uh, most interesting for me uh, is that he, I've said this before about him, but he, he puts it on his CV, too, so it's fair game for me. But he was um, a member of the 1979 Michigan State um, Championship basketball team. And uh, I don't know if he'll comment about that, but it's, I think it's one of his most distinguished uh, accomplishments among the many others. Um, he trained at Harvard and, uh, and also has an MBA from Columbia, which lets him see the business side of things. Uh, but then uh, was, I think, very much influenced by uh, postdoctoral work at UCSF and UCLA. We stole him from New York University, where he was a leader in these fields. Uh, and he's, be he's best known for his work in developmental biology, epithelial cell biology and wound repair, and regenerative um, approaches in science. Um, so Michael is very, very distinguished, well-liked by all of us, and uh, we're very proud of him. Uh, he's going to speak to us this evening uh, about regenerative medicine. What is it? Uh, where do we stand? And where are we going? And he'll leave plenty of time uh, for questions. Michael?
uh, yeah, we're, we're cloning each other. That's why we're in uniform. But I want to I thank my colleague and dean, David Stevenson, for a very kind introduction. I wish my mother, as always, were here to hear that once. Uh, she never believes any of that. But um, so uh, it's an informal uh, discussion we're going to have tonight. I hope to tell you a little bit about something you've been hearing about, which is regenerative medicine, and tell you a little bit about where we're going with it at Stanford. It's also great that we can reach out to the community. I you know, feel very much a member of the community here, live here, and work here. And I know that Stanford uh, is sometimes viewed as trips in traffic, but we certainly are doing things to, I hope, to improve human health. And this, this talk and, and this series is a way to help you understand what goes on inside Stanford. So I think very few people here, uh, it's also the first time I've given a talk with sunglasses on. So if that's annoying, I can take them off. But um, very few people in the United States are really in love with the healthcare system as it stands today. Um, and I'm, I think that's probably an understatement. I think it's uh, somewhat difficult, it's somewhat expensive, it's cumbersome. But more importantly, uh, from the physician scientist standpoint, as Dr. Stevenson and I view it, is it tends to be corrective. In other words, you're, we don't really repair, regenerate, replace, we treat things that have happened. So I think, I think healthcare is, is ripe for a change. Um, just so you know some of the numbers, uh, what we're doing tonight in general education is the second largest industry in the U.S. economy, about 800 billion. Healthcare this year is a little over $2 trillion. So it's the only trillion dollar uh, uh, economy, uh, industry in the United States. A huge amount of resources are spent at the beginning of life. The, uh, the heroic things that uh, Dr. Stevenson and, and, and uh, the people do at Packard and at Stanford and the neonatal ICU is truly extraordinary. And one can value that by having 75 years or 80 years of normal health. That's great. But there's the other end of the spectrum where we spend an awful lot of time and money at the end of life in a time when you can, you can argue is that the highest and best use economically of those dollars. Um, those are very personal things for family members and I've been through it with the uh, death of parents myself. So I think the market is ripe for a different approach and in terms of the business model, what we're really talking about is a, comp you know, a competitive and sustainable advantage in, in this marketplace. And I hope that stem cell biology and regenerative medicine will meet some of that. I, my colleagues send me cartoons a lot, and one of the most recent ones was a picture of Dr. Frankenstein uh, and his assistant Igor working on a patient, and he's asking, now bring me the stem cells. So, you know, I think there's some, there's some misconception about what we do, and I, I certainly don't want any bolts growing out of my neck, for heaven's sakes. But So I, I view regenerative medicine as really a recipe, and, and it's really the seed and the soil concept. So for the seeds, for the most part, and we'll talk more about this in a minute, are the multipotent cells or stem cells. And the semantics here can get fairly tricky, but cells that can become more than one thing. And if you take that as the seed, the soil is probably even more important. So for example, if we're trying to regenerate liver, or we're trying to heal a bone defect, or we're trying to heal a muscle defect, those require all different types of environment for the cell to feel and all different types of signaling or coaching. So if you view the seeds in the soil uh, just as a construct to think about the regenerative medicine, I think you're in good shape. So the inputs would be the key things are, let's say that I'm trying to repair muscle. Well, it turns out at Stanford, in the School of Engineering, in the School of Humanities and Sciences and Medicine, we have muscle developmental biologists who work on what genes are involved and how a cell becomes a muscle cell. We want to recapitulate that blueprint for stem cells. Sometimes that's a chemical signal or a physical signal or a genetic signal or maybe even an emotional signal for all I know, some sort of spiritual signal. But those are the things we're talking about as cells make decisions. So what are we doing at Stanford uh, now with regenerative medicine? The first thing is it involves all seven schools. You know, so just so we're all on the same page, it's humanities and sciences, education, engineering, business, law, earth sciences. Remember, calcium is a mineral. Lots of things to talk about with that. Uh, the school of law, school of medicine, and then the linear accelerator. So we're trying to take input from those disparate disciplines and funneling into how we grow cells, tissues, and organs. That's kind of our approach at Stanford. So it's not just li limited to the school of medicine by, by any means. 
But the School of Medicine has had some interesting things I want to bring you up to speed on organizationally in which we're, we're going about this. So Dean Stevenson and Dean Pizzo about four years ago uh, I wanted to do it a little different. We wanted to organize uh, interdisciplinary programs that break down the barriers of the traditional departments surgery, medicine, pediatrics, or math, or anything like that. So we organized institutes of medicines. So the institutes of medicines that we have now are the Institute of Stem Cell Biology and Regenerative Medicine, which is most uh, uh, pertinent to this conversation. We have a Neuro Institute at Stanford. We have an Infection, Transplantation, and Immunity Institute, and we had a Cardiovascular Institute of Medicine. Dr. Robbins, your next speaker, for example, fits into that. Then we have a Cancer Center. So all of these are interdisciplinary, and every one of these institutes involves stem cells. So that's a new organization for the School of Medicine, and it is our thought that students need to have mentors and co-mentors, uh, graduate students and postdoctoral students, pre-doctoral students, um, from disparate areas. A physician scientist, maybe in pediatrics, maybe co-mentoring a graduate student with a bioengineer, for example. And that's really the fabric that is weaving our labs together, are these uh, interdisciplinary programs for students. Let's talk a little bit about the state, because um, in August in 2001, President Bush made a presidential edict that there be no new generation of human embryonic stem cell lines. Um, and he said that there were 64 lines or 48 lines or 24 lines, and, and you can debate how many of those are still viable, um, but that's what we were limited with at the time. Uh, and that was disappointing if we wanted to move forward in, in an aggressive way to see what the potential of these cells were, because it turns out there's probably a half dozen or so, maybe, of those lines that are viable. I should tell everyone in the audience that all those cells are grown on a feeder layer of cells to give them nutrition which these are human embryonic stem cells, and that feeder layer is, is from mice. So there'd be no hope to use any of these cells that, that we can use and get grants to use from the government clinically. Uh, and in fact, they're very difficult to freeze and thaw, and they're very expensive. So we all, you all in the audience and, and, the, and the stakeholders in California, passed Proposition 71 in November of 2004. And Proposition 71 was the Stem Cell uh, Cure Act, which essentially created this new entity called CIRM, California Institute of Regenerative Medicine. So what's really happened to that over, over the last two and a half years has been um, very complicated. So the concept was you would raise and sell bonds so that you would fund new research in stem cell biology, largely human embryonic stem cells, to 300 million a year for 10 years. An incredibly bold initiative from a state at the time which has run multi-billion dollar annual deficits. But it was essentially a 60-40 landslide victory. So that was the concept. After that, it's been a little more complicated because there's been a, a number of lawsuits that proliferated, then were consolidated, then were adjudicated, then were appealed. But in the next month, that final process, it's very difficult to compete with a helicopter. But we're very proud of our trauma service and life flight uh, service, so we um, we'll, we'll live with that. So that's, that's the concept. So in about a month or so, we'll have the uh, ability to raise and sell those bonds. In the meantime, the governor has loaned money, private individuals and foundations have stepped up and we've been able to get the process going. Um, but that's really what CIRM did. Essentially, over 30 years, we would pay back $6 billion. It always costs more than your mortgage over time on that $3 billion. So that, that really excited us. Um, locally, and that largely kicked off our program in regenerative medicine here. So as you think about applications for human embryonic stem cell biology, I think it's important to know the time horizon we're talking about. So it probably will be two or three decades if we're trying to grow a whole kidney or a whole uh, liver, for example. So whole organ tissue engineering is a much further out goal. But there's lots of things we can do, certainly way before that. For example, the ability to uh, develop novel methods to diagnose and treat disease based on cell models of diseases. 
So for example, cell models of Parkinson's disease or Lou Gehrig's disease. We can learn an awful lot about what goes wrong in the DNA and RNA and proteins when you have that disease by deriving stem cell lines from patients with those problems. And I'll talk a little bit about how you do that. That would be enormously important, and you can do that in the, in the next few years. Second thing is you could develop novel diagnostics. If you know what is going wrong with the blueprint, we can diagnose things much earlier in ways that we can't do now. Then you can think about the whole concept of pharmacogenomics or personalized medicine. If we know the genes that are changing and we know which proteins impact the progression of the disease, we can design, based on screening millions of compounds, novel drugs that don't exist today to treat these. That's all things that we can do without having to wait for the you know, decades it would take to grow a whole liver. Um, so I think it's important to understand the time scale with which Prop 71, the spirit of which that was uh, passed. So with a colleague in the business school, an economist, and a colleague in the law school, Hank Greeley and Lauren Baker, we published a paper about a month ago in, in, a, in a journal, Nature Biotechnology, that says Proposition 71 and the creation of the California Institute of Regenerative Medicine, should we assess a return on this investment? So I want to at least bring you up to speed on ways that we might be thinking about as a state if we're successful with stem cell biology and regenerative medicine and what the return could be. So how do you measure an ROI or return on investment? I'm sure there are people in the audience much more savvy than I am uh, in, in finance, but I'll tell you a little bit about how we did it. So you hear a lot about cures for diseases, and you have disease advocates from multiple groups that are on the California Institute of Regenerative Medicine. But we took a very, very, very conservative approach. We said if we took juvenile onset diabetes mellitus, J-O-D-M, insulin-dependent diabetes, which affects about 13,000 new people a year. And if we said if we could reduce the health burden on that by 50%, not curing it, what would be the impact of that? So then it's, it's interesting to talk a little bit about stem cell biology and how you convert that to a number just for a minute, because I think it's important that you understand what you voted on, either for or against. So, if you can increase the life expectancy, it's, let's say it's 78 on average for uh, women always live longer than men, as my wife points out to me. Um, so let's say it's 78 years on average. So it's 55 years if you have type 1 diabetes. So let's say that you came up with a therapy that would have happened elsewhere in the world, but because you put these dollars in in California, instead of happening in the year 2035, it happened five years earlier. It'd be very difficult for me to justify that advances are going to happen um, anyway, or not anyway, just because we put money in the pot. So I think what we've done is accelerate the discovery process by, by funding uh, to the level we're going to fund. So if you do that, now you have a discovery of something that impacts 50% of the healthcare burden five years ahead. So now you look at all the cohort, those 13,000 people a year, born in 1920 to 2030. And it turns out if you increase their life expectancy by five years and go through the calculations, you have saved about 574,000 people years. Now, healthcare economists will also say, well, we have a way to determine the healthcare burden on a disease. So the concept is one year at perfect health would be 1.0. You could say, okay, if I had type 1 diabetes, I'm going to be conservative and say my health care burden on an index of people's opinions is 0.9 or 0.8 or 0.7. So by that number, you can multiply and, and do some mathematical calculations to develop what's called a quality-adjusted life year. So you're having a burden of 0.9 times a number, and it's a big number. And then you could say, okay, how much do I value that? And, and there are ways that healthcare economists have done this for decades. Let's just say we're valuing that at $50,000, one quality, quality adjusted life year. So now you do the numbers, and you're talking about a big number. It's $28 billion in savings from a 50% reduction on one disease that affects 13,000. If you do cancer or heart disease or things that have a higher prevalence, you can imagine not just curing but even reducing a burden, you get a big economic return in theory. This is important because we have to really know 
what we invested in before I even tell you what it is we do. So, but it's more than that. So you decrease, you can value the extended life if we're able to use stem cells, for example, to replace some of the function of the cells that sense glucose and make insulin, which is a very specific type of cell in your pancreas. You don't need a whole pancreas transplant. You need the cells that can do that, just taking the case of diabetes. So now all of a sudden you say, but it's more than that. Those people are more productive in society because they're able to work without having the ravages of that health problem, or at least half of them. Then you could say, well, the cost savings from not having to treat that, despite how expensive the therapy is initially over the lifetime of the individual. It comes out to be about $42 billion just with the juvenile onset diabetes taking away half the burden. That's a pretty big deal, but you ask yourself, is it good enough to avoid the alternative investment? So if the state of California said, we're not going to take $3 billion or $300 million a year, we're going to put it in another account that gets 10% return. Well, by 2030, that would be a significant number. That's $26 billion, right, on, a, on an annualized investment. So not discounting the dollars, even a partial cure of a very important problem works economically, ignoring all the personal and health benefits that come from that. So I just wanted to give you an idea of how we might be able to justify the investment in the science I'm going to talk to you about. Now, our regenerative medicine program at Stanford, as Dean Stevenson talked about, has all the different schools, has about 300 faculty, not just in the School of Medicine, in the Department of Mathematics, in the Department of Statistics, in healthcare economics, et cetera. So what we're trying to do is work with cells and work with the environment either to lead to novel therapies or train future leaders. That's the goal of our educational programs. So how are we doing after, what, two and a half years after we passed the initiative? Um, how, how is Stanford doing? Because there have been four opportunities to apply based on our about 90 scientists who work with stem cells across the university. How have we done amongst the other institutions in the state? There have been four opportunities to apply for grants. I'm obviously biased, and this is a geocentric view in Stanford and Palo Alto, but there was a training grant we could apply for, which we did, and we got the highest score in the state and funded the most of the trainees, which was good. Then we had these smaller grants or seed grants. Now, this is based on borrowed dollars, either from the governor or philanthropy from individuals or foundations, to get rolling. The seed grants, again, Stanford scientists had the most awards and the most money in the state, which is really terrific. Then there was the next category, which is a little more comprehensive, larger grants, again, funded by this Proposition 71, and again, Stanford did well. And now we had a shared facility grant. How do we train scientists and students to examine these cells? They're very finicky to grow. So Dr. Rene Rejo-Pera, who with the help of the deans, we moved from UCSF. Uh, we had the, the top score in that state. So at least the early returns, so to speak, on the invested dollar, Stanford has been the leader in the state. And I think we have a lot to be proud of for that. So what are stem cells? I know you hear a lot about them. Uh, when you think about them biologically, you have a cell. A cell makes a daughter cell. That daughter cell can self-renew that population, or it can go on to differentiate into something else. And that's really the basis of what a stem cell is. It has the ability to go on to become something else as well as replenish itself. That's a fundamental um, biology of what stem cells are. Simply put, you may think of them as being able to become more than one thing. You have about 210 types of cells in your body. When the egg and sperm come together, from that one cell, obviously you have 210 types of cells. As those cells differentiate and grow into a ball of cells and then slightly larger and larger and larger, then you get patterning to happen. Cells become, are going to be patterned to become the head or neck or the liver or the arms, and they have a limited ability to be rerouted. So that's the concept of stem cell biology. So there are embryonic stem cells. If you take cells derived from the egg and the sperm coming together, and within about the first five or six days, there are several hundred cells that still have the ability to become anything in the embryo. Those are the human embryonic stem cells you'll hear about all the time. And those are what are, we call totipotent or pluripotent. They can become essentially any type of cell in the body. There are also adult stem cells in our body. I don't know if people think about this all the time, and, and I always... Uh, I'm amazed about it. So bone marrow has multiple types of cells in the body. 
blood forming cells. So bone marrow is the spongy inner workings of the bone, not the hard core of the, uh, the outer core of the bone. So you can have bone form, uh, blood forming stem cells, or you can have bone forming cells in there. For example, in your s intestine, you have the ability to replenish your intestine or skin or your hair. About 60 times in your lifetime, hair dies and falls out and is replaced by a new root. So these things happen all the time in our body. Then we have, those are adult stem cells, or what we call postnatal stem cells, after you're born. Then you'll have stem cells that are derived from what's called somatic cell nuclear transfer. And this is an important one that we review for a second. If I put a Q-tip in my mouth and roll it around and take it out, I have about 500 cells on that Q-tip. Those cells are one of those 210 types of cells. There are mucosa cells in my mouth. Does that make sense? If I take the nucleus out of that cell, my DNA, which has been now programmed over time, and I want to emphasize this, the DNA is the same from the egg and the sperm coming together to the oral mucosa cell, except you, it's been reprogrammed and there are proteins that are folded over it such that it's only becoming that type of cell. But the genetic code is all there to become anything. If I take that nucleus out under the microscope, so the DNA, now if I put that into an embryonic stem cell after removing the nucleus, that nucleus from me, my adult mucosa cell, into an embryonic stem cell gets reprogrammed when in Rome. So by being in that sandbox, all that protein that was folded on unfolds, and now I have the ability to become any cell in the body again. So that's the concept of why people would like to be able to do that. That cell now immunologically is from you, by you, for you, for en virtually any cell you want to need in your body. That's the concept of somatic cell nuclear transfer. Taking a, a nucleus out of a cell that's fully committed to be one type of cell, putting it into an embryonic, literally into an embryonic cell, and it gets reprogrammed. And in fact, for the guys in the audience, this is going to be difficult to believe, but when the egg and the sperm come together, the female, the female or the egg cytoplasm reprograms. Right from the beginning, you're told what to do, believe it or not. The male component. And, my, and, and again, I, I'm telling you the truth. I, you know, I live it every day, too. But that, that, that is reprogramming at the very beginning. So you've got two cells coming together. The female cell quickly says, look, I'm the lead goose. Get in line. Here's, how we're, here's where we're going from here on in. You're done. So, so that's the concept of why nuclear transfer makes sense. You could do that again. So put it in an environment that allows you to become any cell. You're able to do that. That's what you keep reading about, nuclear transfer. What's the big deal? It's reprogramming. Then there have been a series of articles come out in the last month. And I just want to take a moment to review these with you. That concept of doing nuclear reprogramming, a group in Japan and a group in Boston has said, we think there are four master genes. We think there are four master genes. You don't have to do anything. You could take the Q-tip in my mouth. You could take a skin cell. You can do anything you want. And if we add these four genes using viruses, now, again, you would never do this clinically. But just by putting these four key genes from looking at how reprogramming happened, we can turn a fibroblast, a skin cell, into an embryonic stem cell. And it can be derived into an animal and form the, a, a whole animal. And that happened. And that's called reprogramming using just master gene expression. So you can imagine all the controversy now. Are you destroying life? Are you creating life? Whatever. But imagine five years from now where you don't even touch an embryo. Put a Q-tip in your mouth. You reprogram your own adult cell. Everyone's happy. So, the first step toward that was, is it possible? Even though you have to put vi a virus to get these four genes in, once you get them in, that cell, any one cell here from the skin, can become an embryonic stem cell. So that's where we're going. I don't think the controversy that we're bogged down in now is going to be around long if you could do that, because that just circumvents the whole system. And then lastly, uh, again, pioneered at Stanford, uh, the concept of a cancer stem cell, which is a stem cell we're not going to talk about tonight. But a cancer stem cell makes perfect sense. A surgeon will remove all the tumor, or, the, or anyone doing an operation, if you will, remove all the tumor that you can see or feel. 
but sometimes tumors reoccur. So it would make sense that just a few of those little devils you leave in there, if those are the cells that are the stem cells that give rise to the cancer, then the tumor will recur. Does that make sense? So there are cancer stem cells that have been pioneered here at Stanford for breast, for colon, for the blood cancers. Now, full disclosure, that's a little bit ahead of the curve. The rest of the country might not quite believe that, but of course, we're convinced to a moral certainty. So I, I, hope, I hope you're drinking our Kool-Aid. I gotta take off my sunglasses now. Um, so anyway, those are the major types of stem cells, just so you know. Embryonic, adult, nuclear transfer, reprogramming adult cells, cancer cells. So when you say stem cells, I'm gonna confuse you even more. There are at least four or five types, but you're, we're gonna talk mainly about the embryonic ones today. Um, so the egg and the sperm come together, take that little area out, you culture those cells, and that's the excitement, okay? So you're able to grow, you're able to, if we knew, now, Here's what you don't know, it's not often said. If I take those cells that can become anything and I inject them into a mouse that doesn't have an immune system, human cells, into the mouse, it's so unorganized, it's like watching my seven-year-old soccer practice, so to speak. Those cells do become anything, but they're just a ball of cells with hair or bone or teeth. It's a teratoma, it's a benign growth, but it, it's not organized. So the trick is, the embryo really has three layers, an outer layer called ecto or out, a middle layer, mesoderm, which is muscle bone cartilage, and then an inner layer, endoderm. If you can get those cells into those three layers, so to speak, a little bit down the road, then you put them in an animal and they become more like you want them to be. So we still need to do a lot of work on how do you do those early commitments. I don't want you to become all 210, I want you to be this middle layer. We don't know that coaching yet. So there's a lot of heavy lifting, which isn't so glamorous, which is very fundamental to getting that totipotent cell to become one of the three layers. Then we can really work with it. So that's what the next three or four years really is about. What are the signals that do that? How do you coach that? We already know these four genes can get you back to the 210, but we don't want that. We want you to become inner, middle, or outer layer. Now, just a word about what happens in our body. So if you don't have a pet, most of the dust in your house is your skin, which every six days sloughs off. It goes to the cornified layer as a barrier, for example. Uh, in your intestine, every six days, you have all these little crypts or these little crevices. The stem cells migrate up, get into the lumen of your intestine, and are sloughed off. It happens all the time. Every six years, every cell in your skeleton is turned over. If you go up in a space capsule and there's no gravity, on forces, then you demineralize your skeleton very dramatically. So every one of us in the audience here is continually replenishing some aspect of our body. You just don't think of it all the time. It's not quite like Jiffy Lube, where you go every 3,000 miles and you get the checkup. So we age a little bit on the margin every day. Um, and I think that's important. The other thing I just uh, want to make sure everyone knows is, you know, it's, it's, it, it, there are organs that completely regenerate for anyone in the audience here. If I remove 90% of a person's liver and they're reasonably healthy, as long as you have the blood and nourishment coming from the intestine, you'll regenerate to 9% of your body weight. So there's an example. Can we really learn? And we're the people in pediatric liver service and adult pediatric surgeons and liver transplant surgeons are using cells in that regrowth engineer the liver. Might that circumvent the problems of waiting for a liver if you need it? Yes. So there are examples of postnatal or adult regenerative medicine all the time. Tens of thousands of people receive stem cell transplants, in theory, stem cell transplants, because of bone marrow transplantation to save people after they've been radiated and to near death for cancer. Replenish that. Okay. Irv Weissman, the director of our Stem Cell Institute in 1988, said this type of cell right here gives you all the, red, red, the, the blood, red blood forming cells for oxygen, the white blood forming cells for your fighting cells. So hematopoietic stem cell transplantation happens all the time. Pioneered at Stanford, but millions of people around the world get bone marrow transplantation. So we are doing stem cell transplantation either inside your body or in the clinic. You just don't think of it that way because it's not the controversial embryonic cells. So it is, it is, it is real. So as you think about translational medicine, when, when um, someone's in the clinic taking care of an adult or a child, there's a problem. 
And in surgery, it's usually not enough tissue. You struggle for healthy tissue. So the question is, might we go to the laboratory, engineer that tissue, go back in the body, and have it replaced? That's our concept of, you'll hear the term translational medicine used a lot. It means, for one thing, we're probably not going to change humanity or transform health here at Stanford by me sending an envelope out of my garage or my office. Even though garages in Palo Alto have led to big things, I, full, I fully admit that. So, but what we need to do is have these novel discoveries that are fundamental in any of the schools and then commercialize those in a way that they're available in our hospitals. So there's a big effort at Stanford in translational medicine, taking the basic discovery and going into a clinical trial to impact health. So that's what our definition of translating is, translating it to you. That's what we're talking about. So you've seen lots of things in the last 10 years. You've seen an ear cartilage that's grown, put on the back of a mouse with an immune system or a nose, and I've published lots of papers on that. The question is, what's wrong with that? Why don't we see that clinically? Well, it turns out there's a lot wrong with it. First of all, those chondrocytes, cartilage-forming cells, grow really slowly. It takes three or four months to get enough cells to even do a small construct for part of the ear. The other thing is you don't have a lot of excess cartilage in your body. As the, the sad thing is, is you know, I'm, I've aged a lot because of the basketball year. So you know, I'm looking at joints all the time thinking, boy, I'm getting a little stiffer. But, so we, we don't have excess cartilage to borrow, and it takes a long time to grow. So the key is, might we come up with a different source of cells, for example, for cartilage or bone or muscle or nerve or whatever you're thinking of? So when you look at what I do, which is craniofacial surgery or surgery mainly on children's faces or adult, adults um, who have been injured or have reconstruction, let's take a look, just think about what we do in a, in, in a day. So my colleagues might be faced with someone who's been, had a gunshot wound in the face. You can imagine how horrific that is, a big defect. It involves the skin and the bone and the nerves to smile and the teeth, et cetera, et cetera. There's lots of things that could be injured. So what do we do? Well, we put back the, the deep layers first. So you start with the foundation. Then you do the electrical and plumbing. And last thing you do is paint the outside. So we start with the bones, for example. I'm trying to, you know, I'm undergoing a renovation of a house, so it's been a nightmare. But for you contractors out there, we love you. Um, so you start with the bone. But we don't have excess bone in the body. So we put metal plates on. You say, well, that looks good, but if I showed you an x-ray, you'd say, well, that's not, that's fine, but that's really not the bone. And then we don't do anything for the teeth unless we have bone grafts that we put in later and pound the teeth in. The muscle is not replaced because we're not regenerating muscle. The nerve is not replaced. And the skin, we may move a, a piece of skin from the arm, cut it out of the body, move it under a microscope, plug it in here, a 15-hour operation. That may get you the skin. Or you may say you have two bones, bones in your lower leg, the tibia, the big bone, which is about 85% of what you walk on. Then there's this little outer bone, like your baby finger, called the fibula. You could take the fibula and move that under an artery and vein and do another 12-hour operation. That could replace that, too. But it's a fraction of the size of the bone you need. So we borrow from Peter to pay Paul, but we don't have unlimited supply. And at the end, it looks a little bit like a patchwork. Yes, it's not a big hole in the face, but it's not regenerative medicine. So that's kind of state of the art. That would be multiple operations, 10 or 12 of them. So at the end of the day, that's good, but I don't think that's what we're looking for. So how might we do this differently? So the concept, again, going back to the seeds and soils, can we identify a population of cells right now? And I'm going to talk about an adult stem cell therapy that we could do. So the first thing we did was adopt a little different strategy. If we don't have an unlimited supply of bone or cartilage or muscle, what cells could be available? So it turns out that I'm from the Midwest, and California's are in some way. That was the, is this cutting out? Or, you know, once we get technology at Stanford, we're going to have something, believe me. <laughs> so once, so the concept of being from the Midwest is a little different than being from California. I mean, I moved out here. I lost weight. I got in shape. You know, I tried to get in good shape. Walking around the Midwest, you'll notice that there is a great natural resource in America, and it's called fat. So, and I believe me, I've, I've, I grew up in the Midwest. So the concept would be 500,000 Americans pay cash money to have their fat sucked out, liposuction, and it's thrown away. And the average liposuction, 
no one in this audience would even be a candidate, is about three liters. It's disgusting, but it's really liquid gold. Turns out other laboratories around the world found out that in there, there are multipotent cells that line the blood vessels, not the fat cells themselves, and there are about a billion of them per liter. So now you say, well, geez, that's pretty available. And when you had dinner tonight or have that second dessert, you're making investment in your health. Remember that. <laughs> so that's a little bit like an annuity. So keep eating because you're, you're helping yourself. So the concept is, might we take a readily available, non-controversial, I think ethically pretty free of all that, unless you don't believe in liposuction, which is I'm not even going to get into, you could take those cells, and, and it's not just my laboratory, many laboratories have done it, and now we're coaching those cells to become a muscle cell. This is the middle layer, the middle layer of the, of the, of the embryonic sandwich, or cartilage or bone. So if you did that, you could have a lot of cells potentially. And one of the things we've done is say, okay, if these cells potentially can become another type of cell, how do we drive that? So it turns out we had very little to offer at that point, but our colleagues in the School of Earth Sciences, in the Department of Geology, people always say, why is Stanford different? There's an example. Bone and calcium are minerals. We have a Department of Geology in a School of Earth Sciences. They are experts at how things mineralize. So they encouraged us to coat a uh, sponge, if you will, with the layer that is like a starfish, like the calcium you feel uh, on a starfish, for example. They said that will be very strong signal for a multipotent cell that could become bone cartilage or muscle to become bone. And our bioengineer colleague said, sure, we can coat that. We could do it at a nano layer. We can do it this fast. So we just really provided the cells. And if you do that and you make a huge defect in a mouse's skeleton that'll never heal in the lifetime of the animal, those fat-derived cells will regenerate that completely just as bone marrow or bone cells do, except you have a lot more of them and they do it actually a little faster. So the concept of where we might be going with a tangible example of regenerative medicine for adults right now, adults meaning post-birth, is that you could aspirate fat in the operating room or a week ahead of time. You don't need liters, believe me, you just need a, a few cc's of it. And then you might go right back into that patient on the operating table because it's your bat in your system. But with the bioengineers, instead of putting a plate on, we might be putting a degradable plate that would degrade by your own body over two years. And as that happened, it would be replaced by bone. So one could imagine 10 years from now that when you need your hip replacement, as I undoubtedly will, maybe we are using bone marrow cells or fat-derived cells or the reprogrammed cells from my mouth, for example, maybe the bioengineers are saying, don't cut off the diseased hip, don't glue in the metal, and then don't tell me not to do too much because it'll loosen up 15 years. Maybe over two years, you're walking on that, and as it degrades because your body's replacing it, it's becoming bone. And oh, by the way, we're going to put the signal right here for cartilage. So that's really what we're talking about as a way of non-controversial cells from bone marrow or fat or whatever you're thinking with bioengineering, School of Earth Sciences, and the developmental biology coaching. That's how stem cell biology uh, is an example of what we may be able to do. Now, I talk about a little bit about these stem cells because they're very clever. And you may ask, do you have to put them where you want it to go? So, you know. If you drive around Palo Alto on, uh, off Page Mill, you'll see all these signs that say stem cells and arrow or something like that. They're referring to companies, but I always joke, in, in Palo Alto, our stem cells just traffic because they follow the signs. So what we said was, we're going to make an injury on a mouse. Let's say it's in muscle or say it's in bone or skin. We're going to inject these fat-derived multipotent cells. Again, we're not talking about, we're only talking about the middle layer now. These will not become brain, for example. They won't become gut. But if you want them to become bone or cartilage, they'll do that. If we inject them in the blood system and, and with our colleagues in uh, molecular imaging, we label them just like a firefly does. So you can see it at night with luciferase, the same enzyme. Now they'll turn green. So now we inject them in the blood system. And let's say we made a hole somewhere, an injury somewhere. The alarms go off on the molecular level and cellular level that there's inflammation there. Those cells will traffic to the site of injury. And when they get there, they don't become liver or nerve, they become bone or whatever you're asking them to be. So it may be that we don't even have to do a major operation. It may be that the stem cells 
traffic to where they go, and then they're given a contextual information. This is a bone defect. I better not become liver. Does that make sense? So they're very clever, and, and I think that's something that uh, leads to the specter that perhaps these aren't major operations in the future. Maybe you're using a nanoscale device to deliver stem cells. Again, I'm talking about cell-based therapy, not growing the whole liver or growing an, uh, the whole bone, but just repairing the defect. So I think that's pretty interesting and pretty exciting. Uh, and again, I talk about bedside tissue engineering, doing something in the operating room or the bedside and going right back into that patient. So um, I think one of the things that really bothers me is when you operate on a child's face or adult's face, it's how you socialize to a great degree as you look at someone's face. And I think it's pretty amazing that while bone or cartilage are the foundation of a house, you pretty much pay attention when it comes to paint and wallpaper and the shutters, because that's what people are going to see, or at least that's what my wife is telling me. So we do have a blueprint on how to get skin to heal without a scar. That blueprint, believe it or not, is everyone in this audience, just up to the time about the third trimester, healed wounds without a scar. You lost that ability in about the last third of you before you were born. <clears throat> so now you say, well, that's interesting. That's a blueprint. Embryonic wound healing or fetal wound healing is without a scar. And I've done lots of operations on embryonic animals, whether they be mice or rabbits or you name it, rats, um, and, they, and sheep. And they all heal without a scar. So there's an example. So one of the colleagues, uh, uh, there's a combination of a group in dermatology and plastic surgery that is looking at how those wounds would heal without a scar. <clears throat> and what we found, us and many other people, have found that there's a population of stem cells along the hair follicle that have the ability to regenerate, including hair. Now, one of the things you may not think about is when you see a scar, there's no hair in the scar. So you're drawn to that bare area. You're drawn to the scar's shape, its color, its texture, but there's no hair. So you can regenerate now up to a one by one centimeter defect in mice by isolating the stem cells from the adult, adult meaning postnatal hair follicle, which is pretty neat. So the combination of the embryo healing without a scar, meaning these are the signals you want to provide to those cells, and the seed of the stem cells around the hair follicle shaft is pretty exciting. So in the last two years, we have a lot more confidence that we'd be able to might regenerate these things. Wound healing is, is, is near and dear to my heart because it's a great, it's, it's what I've been working on a long time. And I'll give you some facts you might not think about. Human beings are the only species on the planet that overheal. It's very difficult to get a mouse to heal with a thick scar, virtually impossible. Except we have things that are called keloids. Pierced ear injury, a scar the size of a golf ball or a softball, that only happens in humans. No other species on the planet makes too much scar except humans. So that's been a little bit of a problem for animal models. How are you going to diminish scarring when you need to work in animal models? So it turns out working with mechanical engineers and material scientists, Stanford uh, surgeons like Jeff Gertner, who's a plastic surgeon, are trying to manipulate the mechanical environment or manipulate the chemical environment or manipulate the electrical environment in a way that we can downregulate scarring. So I think that's also exciting. The other thing to think about is when you think about the evolutionary pressures on wound repair, and not that anyone does, but I do, um, so you can imagine the Neanderthal or the caveman, so to speak, or cavewoman, a saber-toothed tiger or the types of injury that happened in those days was massive. Agreed? It's much larger than a scalpel going down. And by the way, there are 55 million incisions a year with scalpels. This is a big deal. So if you bled to death or you got infected, you were selected out. So the evolutionary pressures for wound healing are speed. Doesn't matter if it doesn't function. Get a spot well down there and you won't bleed to death, you won't be infected. That's fine when it's a saber-toothed tiger taking off your hindquarters, but today when an incision goes down at Stanford Hospital or Packard Hospital, that same response to injury is way overdone. That's the problem. So how do we take that needle, normal wound healing, which is like 2020 vision, normal, but 2010 vision, someone could see at 20 feet what a 2020 vision person sees at 10. So we want to go to less and less scarring. We want to move that needle. We don't want to be in the pathologic scarring. So it turns out that Dr. Lorenz, uh, in, uh, who's a plastic surgeon, and his colleagues have started with 30,000 genes in the mice, and they're down to about 98 
that are differentially expressed. Uh, another piece of technology at Stanford, which you may not be aware of, is these little gene chips to look at 30,000 genes at a time. That was pioneered by Pat Brown and colleagues in biochemistry here. Just an example of technology that comes out of Stanford that changes the way we view things. So now you're down to 98 genes by saying this wound heals with a, without a scar and this one scars and looking at the difference. And that requires a very sophisticated analysis by a computer. I'm classically trained to look at one gene at a time. When I was a postdoc, I'm already a dinosaur. I'm obsolete. Now the computer and the students who are facile between computer science and biological sciences, so-called biocomputation, are able to look at 30,000 genes at a time. So I think we're moving towards therapies such that at the time of an incision, you would either have biopsied the hair follicle cells, isolated those stem cells, and regenerate that wound, or you'd be turning down things that lead to scarring or adding back things that you don't have. So they're no longer going to make an incision, sew it up carefully, put a dressing on, and let God's take its course, because we know that ends up with scarring. So that's pretty passive, and as a surgeon, particularly a plastic surgeon, I don't think that's acceptable. But we're moving towards some sort of intervention to prevent scarring. Now, scarring is not just skin deep. You know, if you have your spinal cord severed in an accident, that's horrible, and obviously you're paralyzed, but it's the scar that forms there that prevents the nerves from, from reconnecting. So think about scarring pulmonary fibrosis fibrosis in the lungs, liver cirrhosis. There's all kinds of scarring in the body. I'm focused on the skin, but there's scarring everywhere. And that's what we're trying to target. Again, as a little different thought for what regenerative medicine is, that has nothing to do with stem cells, but it would be able to regenerate the skin. Boy, this is, you know, this is tough. Um, so that's what we're trying to do, is take a response to injury on an adult or a child and prevent scarring and allow for tissue regeneration. That is not encumbered by embryonic stem cell legislation. So there's another example, adult stem cells, and now uh, an approach where you manipulate that. So I just think regenerative medicine is something that I want you to think about broadly. Um, it's cell-based therapy, which we've talked a little bit about. One could imagine taking, now let's just take the example of an embryonic stem cell or the reprogrammed cell. I put the Q-tip in my mouth, I reprogram that cell. Now let's say I need to regenerate the, the nerves in my brain that aren't making enough dopamine for Parkinson's. Well, now I have a type of cell that can become a dopaminergic cell, secreting cell. So if I can coach it in that and put it where I need to, that'll be a cell-based therapy. I don't need a new brain. I just need cells that are making that. I mentioned diabetes, for example, or Lou Gehrig's disease. We don't know what causes that. But in diabetes, it's an islet cell. It's less than a million cells in your body. Um, you don't need a new pancreas. You just need the cells that sense glucose and make insulin. So regenerative medicine may be cell-based therapy to replace the cells that are deficient or missing. It could be a local therapy like I described, something that you're injecting at the time after an incision prior to sewing it up to prevent scarring. May not be an embryonic stem cell at all. May be something to downregulate scarring. It may be a device. If I said the bioengineers and the nanoscience people here can inject something into your body that's about one half the size of a cell, you won't even feel it. That'll go in through a catheter for cardiac catheterization. Let's say, for example, you have a heart attack, and the heart attack is what? Not enough blood supply to the muscle. The muscle dies, it's painful, and it ends up in a scar. It doesn't regenerate the muscle. Well, if that scar is large enough in the pumping chamber, it doesn't pump so well. Heart failure, does that make sense? So what if you could use a nanoscale device to inject embryonic or adult stem cells into that area but we have bioengineers who do self-assembling polymers, a sponge, if you will, that comes together in the body because it's thermally active. It's a liquid at one temperature, gets in the body. It's another temperature, has different properties. And the cells you mix in there are now pulsed with a small electrical current because the nanoscale catheter degrades over time and does that. It releases the genes that those cells need to become muscle cells of the heart and you're able to regenerate that defect. So it may be a device. That's where we're going on, na on nanosystems. It may have nothing to do with stem cells. 
So there's other aspects of regenerative medicine to think about. And then it may be a systemic therapy. Because, um, because we study patients who are developing osteoporosis, pick something like that. Well, that's a systemic problem where you have bone forming cells and bone degrading cells, and they're just a little bit off, and over 40, 50, 60, 70, 80 years, you demineralize your skeleton. So maybe that's not taking Phosphomax. Maybe that's a drug or a small molecule that makes the bone forming equal to the bone degrading. That's an example of a systemic therapy. We would know that because of somatic cell nuclear transfer from patients with severe osteoporosis or their bone cells, we'd know what genes are different. So it could be a cell, it could be a device, it could be a local injection, it could be something you take as a pill or in your blood seam. So regenerative medicine is lots of different things. It's not just the human embryonic stem cell. That's one thing I want um, you to get from this. The other thing is, in cancer, we're not even going to talk about that. But it may be there are some early reports coming out of MD Anderson Cancer Center that if you use an embryonic stem cell to deliver chemotherapy or radiation therapy or things like that, it doesn't do collateral damage. It just goes after the tumor. It knows cancer from non-cancer. So, you know, that would be wonderful if you could use stem cells as smart bombs, so to speak, to deliver what you want. That's not what's said a lot, but hey, that's a derivative of understanding technology. So there are lots of things to think about when you're thinking of regenerative medicine. And then David Stevenson runs the largest, most complex and efficient neonatal ICU and, and women and children's center probably in the country, if not the world. So my postdoctoral research fellowship was in a pediatric surgery at, uh, laboratory at UCSF where they were doing these heroic operations, one in 10,000 children with an abnormal ultrasound. You might want to operate on the mom and the em embryo before birth because it'd be too late. Heroic stuff and very complicated. You're not going to do it very much. But that led to the observation of fetal wound healing and other things, which I always think of being in like NASA. You know, who, who's touched by going to the moon? Well, when you have cell phones and computers, you start to realize there are derivatives that touch all our lives. So one of the things that struck me is three years ago, I had a postdoctoral research fellow come to a regenerative medicine training grant. David Stevenson was kind enough to give me the template. Thank you, David, for his developmental biology and neonatology training grant. And we used that to do an interdisciplinary program. If you want to come to Stanford and train in regenerative medicine, you're going to have a physician scientist, and you're going to have a basic scientist, and they're going to be in two different areas. You're going to go to both of their group meetings, and you're going to learn the language in two different areas, because that will give you something that's not traditional and break down the barriers. So there was a woman who came to a lab in, in developmental biology here. Karen Liu was an architect working on Wall Street, decided she wanted to go to Columbia to go to night school studied biology, and then wanted to become a scientist, was unhappy with living and working on Wall Street, which I can understand. So she moves to Berkeley, which I didn't understand. <laughs> just, just kidding. It's wonderful. Um, she uh, performs a PhD at Berkeley in, I know, it's bad timing. So um, it's not like I'm a dog whisperer, for heaven's sakes. But so Karen goes to Berkeley and works on frog development and gets a PhD. She then applies to with Jerry Crabtree, who's a very famous developmental biologist uh, at Stanford, and has somehow paired my laboratory with Dr. Crabtree's laboratory. Karen said, you know what? I think we can design a drug that you could give to a pregnant mom that would cross the placenta and rescue a birth defect. I said, well... <laughs> sounds great. I don't think so, but you're very bright and ambitious. So she said, I'm going to link your lab and, and Crabtree's lab and the chemistry lab, and I think we can do it. So she designed a system. Now, this is a little bit technical, so bear with me. She designed a system where if she took and added a tag, a handle, if you will, onto a protein that was very social. This protein liked to be involved in lots of different things in the cell. She put a tag on it. She added something to it, so it's got a handle on it. And the cell, the other cells in the body, don't like that handle, and they degrade it. So it's like not having that gene, if you will. OK? So you put a handle on it, and it's degraded. So when we looked at those, um, those animals, amazingly, it was as if they didn't have the gene, so-called knockout. Well, it turns out all the animals had a cleft palate. And cleft lip and palate, believe it or not, is the second most common birth defect uh, there is after club foot. So about 1 in 600 to 1 in 1,000 children have a hole in the middle of their face when they're born, and it can involve the lip or the gum or the palate. OK? 
can be only this or it can be all the way through, cleft lip and palate. It's a very common problem. If it's a cleft palate alone, it's about one in 2,000 people. So what Karen said was, huh, that's interesting. In mice, the palate forms, mice are born 20 days after the egg and sperm come together, just in two days, 48 hours. I'm wondering if I could design a drug that would cross the placenta, bind that handle, so now it's not going to be degraded. Remember I told you the thing, the tag you put on it makes the gene degraded? So the drug would cross the placenta, bind to that, prevent it from being degraded. And if I do that just during the two days the palate comes together, I wonder if I'll be able to have the embryo rescue itself. So it turns out, lo and behold, that's what happened. If she gave the drug that the chemistry department, developmental biology department in my lab, uh, probably in that order, I was the least significant of that, came together, that cleft palate would be rescued. So that was the first example of now you're really talking about a drug. We're not talking about stem cells to rescue a very common birth defect. It's a totally artificial system, but it suggests that when I'm talking about smart drugs that we could do, we could give, now this would be a very high bar because you've got an unborn patient, you've got a mom, but if you could do it in a way, that would be fantastic. You don't have to wait and see the problems that develop after birth. Let me just uh, conclude by saying regenerative medicine is more than embryonic stem cells. We're not on hold because we're wait waiting for the courts to settle that. There's adult stem cells, there's small molecules, there's the regenerative medicine you do each day in your body. So at Stanford, we have the seven schools and the two great hospitals. We'd like to take this awesome talent and bring it together in ways that you wouldn't have if you just had a medical school or just had a hospital. And that happens every day with the chemists and the engineers and the physician scientists. We're trying to leverage this technology, not just one patient at a time. It's a, it's a very rewarding experience to close a cleft on a child. It's wonderful. It's one child at a time. If you could prevent that or minimize the scarring on the repair, you could, you could impact millions of patients, just as an example. So I'm not trying to put us out of business. I think that physicians and scientists working together uh, we're here to do what's right for the patient. So regenerative medicine is broad at Stanford. I think it will become deeper over time. It's not just the controversy surrounding embryonic stem cells. It, it's a lot of different things. So I hope I've demystified it a little bit. I thank you for your attention. I'm happy to take any questions. Pretty good for a basketball player, huh? <laughs> you also get a sense of team science, which I think is very, very important. And we can't do a lot of these things without working with each other, and we come from all different disciplines, and it's really a synergy, and it's taking place right here, so it's, I think, a really exciting time for all of us. Yes? Thank you. That was fascinating. How close are you clinically? How close are we clinically to what? Oh. Uh, well, the short answer is probably not close because it's a systemic problem and, it, and we would need to unlock the bone forming versus bone degrading. And the bone forming cells come from the skeleton, the bone degrading cells actually come from the blood, the blood forming cells. So there are lots of products being targeted for that, um, but the hope is that you would make those two match rather than just being a little off. So, but that's the concept, and that's a tough one. It's much more likely that we do something locally to get a fracture to heal in the hip of an 80-year-old patient before they develop a blood clot or a pneumonia, get them backing up walking by something locally. So I think local is going to come before systemic for that problem. The, re the, state, the question was, how close are we clinically to treating osteoporosis, the whole body. How, how close are we to uh, being able to produce uh, islet cells to cure diabetes? And is diabetes low-hanging fruit in the, in the stem cell cure domain? Um, well, uh, so, the, so the, everyone heard the question. So the, the answer is that um, diabetes and the ability to put a cell in the body that is physiologically adept at sensing glucose and making appropriate amounts of insulin in real time uh, is one of the holy grails to cell-based therapies for regenerative medicine. Um, I do not believe it's low-hanging fruit because of the complexities of being able to do what I just said. It's an enormously compelling target, and it's, in fact, why we use that as a model 
when we're talking about the economic return. It's just so compelling. And, it's, and the concept is so simple. One type of cell, you don't need the whole pancreas. It turns out that it's very complicated to get an embryonic stem cell to endoderm and then do that. So Seung Kim, Irv Weissman, uh, developmental biologists here are dedicated to that problem. We have a whole cluster of people from around the campus who have come together for the diabetes target. It's one of our major efforts. Uh, that being said, I, I can't say that we're close because we have a lot of heavy lifting to do, but it's certainly very high on the radar screen because it's so compelling in terms of the biomedical burden and it's a single cell type. You could say the same thing about Parkinson's disease, making dopamine. I, you were speaking about many different aspects of this regenerative medicine, not just the embryonic stem cells, which is affecting the federal funding. Yet we hear from the media that uh, because of the restrictions on, on uh, funding uh, from the federal government, that a lot of scientists are moving overseas to England and, and Korea and all these other places. To what extent uh, is the federal funding supporting some of these other uh, programs that you've been describing? And is it, uh, do you see it, uh, us being able to keep up with the foreign countries? Well, it's a very interesting question. So we're not used to having a brain drain to other countries and not used to seeing breakthroughs come routinely from abroad, at least in the scientific domain. And in fact, what you describe is true. Many people are now working in other countries. Um, and that's a real challenge for us. Um, the question is, people do that, of course, because they believe that the federal government funds about, I'm going to pick a number, 25 to 30 million dollars for human embryonic stem cells in those 24 lines. The state of California is talking about 12 times that per year. So we were very fired up to be able to get at money that would allow us to move forward. So what do we do in the meantime, just to let you know? Stanford has renovated a uh, facility near campus, not on campus. Uh, so it's essentially Noah's Ark. You have to take the position that in a federal audit under the current administration, this, this talk where we're talking about non-federal lines, this podium, if it was paid for by an NH grant, would violate the law. My phone, my computer. So we literally have renovated separate space, separate equipment, green tag, red tag. Uh, a postdoc research fellow, if they're working on newly derived lines, has to have some percent of their salary not covered by a federal grant. Now, federal grants are the lifeblood of what we do for our research, but not in this area. So private philanthropy, foundation support, and fundraising has allowed us to have separate facilities in the short run to do this. We anticipate that will change in the next year or two, but that was how we m tried to move forward. Um, so that was, uh, it's a bit difficult to be able to track everything and every one as if you had to have two of everything. Now, your question was, are things like adult stem cells fundable? Yes. Yes, they are. The frustration is adult stem cells won't answer, aren't capable of going to diabetes. So if they're competent to become a target and you can have a lot of them, that's great. It's just it's hard for neuro. It's hard for diabetes. There are burdens that we're not going to be able to address with the approaches I talked about. So that's what makes it so compelling. So we've tried to move forward and not just tread water doing some of the things I've talked about, but we recognize that embryonic stem cells obviously can become anything, and that's what we really want to work with. Just to remind people that the investments that were made 10, 20 years ago, the rewards are now. And what's happening in general with respect to federal funding uh, for research in health is a, at best, flat and a, a lowering of the kind of investments. So the returns 10, 20 years from now, that will be the visitation from the decisions being made now about the overall funding for right. investigations that relate to our health care. So it's something important to understand. No, it, it, uh, Dean Stevenson is right. Uh, let's just take, for example, seven, eight years ago, the NIH budget doubled in a five-year period, and now it's kind of a shoulder. If we would have just kept going at an increase of 7 8% per year, we'd be way above where we are now because flat funding actually erodes with inflation. Um, and there are a lot of competing interests. Uh, the government is spending a lot of money in the Middle East every day and, and efforts, and that's one pot of money. So the other thing I want to convey is federal research dollars for research 
are funding about, and I don't have, I'll, I'll just put out a number, about one in nine or one in 10 grants, which take hundreds of hours to prepare. But that's what the NIH and the federal, the federal grants were living on. That's very different than funding one in three. So we're under a lot of fiscal pressure, but we've tried to make it up in other avenues. Can you actually fix uh, a defect, a genetic defect in uh, cells? Uh, you know, take someone's stem cell and then regenerate cells that don't have a particular genetic problem? So the, the question is if, if by looking, so what we really want is we want these disease models in cells. We really want to derive stem cells from someone with Lou Gehrig's disease. We, we want to take a nucleus from a Lou Gehrig's patient, put an embryonic stem cell and said, what changed here compared to a normal cell? We have no idea what really causes that disease. We need disease models based on uh, disease-specific lines. So if I take a Q-tip and put it in the mouth of someone with Parkinson's, I take that nucleus out, how does that affect the gene expression of the cell I put it in? That's what we're talking about disease models in, in cells. Now, your question is, could we change the genes? Could we repair those genes in a way that allowed you to treat that disease? That is what we would like to do if we had a thorough understanding of how the genes are misexpressed, so to speak. It may be that we have to add something back. It was pretty amazing that by using four genes and adding them to an adult fibroblast from the skin, it became totipotent become anything and, in fact, could go on to form a whole animal. That's pretty amazing. So the answer, I think, is yes, but there's a lot of work to do. How are the developments in regenerative medicine influencing changes in curriculum in the medical schools, and what impact is it having on the pharma industry? Two questions. Everyone hear them? So uh, the question is, how does it impact how we're training uh, physicians or scientists. So the medical school here has lots of postdocs at the PhD level as well and pre-docs. But it, we're having a revolution in how we're training physicians. It's much more complicated to be a physician with the explosion of knowledge and diagnostics and therapy. So the dean's office has actually transformed our entire curriculum uh, in, in ways that have been pretty phenomenal in the last five years. For example, you can now choose a concentration or academy, if you will, in stem cell biology and regenerative medicine, where you may take a year out. Instead of four years, it may be five years. So the first two years when you're learning what's wrong with the body before you go into the clinic, you may spread that into three years. And in fact, about 80% of Stanford medical students do an extra year or two of research. So during that year, you would learn the basics of stem cell biology, and then when you're in the clinic, you would do rotations like bone marrow transplant. So it is impacting how we're training our students, and it's just starting to take effect. Students may want to be working in this area, and we're trying to accommodate that. Second question is, how does it change, how does it impact big pharma? Was that the question? So you're, you know, you're located in the largest um, geographic cluster of specialized workforce in the world. And that's a whole other topic about why Silicon Valley hasn't been easily uh, repeated around the world. But so it does impact this. I think uh, the pharmaceutical industry is aware of regenerative medicine. They're not quite sure how to embrace it. Uh, there's no question that tissue engineering or, or replacement of tissue is a big thing. The question is, why aren't companies successful? And I would argue those products aren't very good. There's no question there's a demand, but we need to do a better job, we, meaning basic discovery, of identifying ways that you'd be able to do that. I could take a piece of cartilage from my knee where I don't walk on it, and orthopedic surgeons do not like to do that, obviously, because it's an operation, an orth or arthroscopic operation. You can send that to a company out east, and for a very large amount of money, over a long period of time, they will expand those cartilage cells. They'll send them back in a glue pellet, and the orthopedic surgeon can put it back where you need it. The problem is there's no blood supply to cartilage, so when you tear it, it has to be taken out. You need a blood supply to heal. That's a very expensive and not easily scalable uh, way to go, although it's a, it, it's a, it's a going concern. It's a, it's a, it's a company. Um, so I just think the products aren't very good. There's a huge interest, but no one is quite sure what to make of stem cells and how are we going to create businesses and how are we going to get them in the market. And I think that has been a little slow to respond. The crosstalk between industry and academics is very, very important. 
and it's a very challenging area because you want to maintain your academic values while you educate people and not be fettered by some of the things that drive industry. On the other hand, this future is not going to be possible without talk back and forth and traffic back and forth, and it's probably going to happen in a place just like this. Uh, we're very good at doing this, and it's very, very important for the, the future. Yes. If in two years the federal government multiplies the funds for the research you're talking about, the trained scientists won't be available in two years. Therefore, do you see a large influx of um, foreign scientists being brought in to take advantage of this increase in funding? So I, I, I hope that's not a theoretical uh, situation. I, I hope that it's exactly what happens uh, uh, in terms of increased funding. So we are training, interdisciplinary training for regenerative medicine fellows, 26 people at a time at Stanford are in these programs now. Uh, that's not going to be enough. We're clearly going to need more. So, but, but I do want to emphasize is, and Dean Stevenson may comment, we probably have a thousand or more foreign uh, uh, PhD students who are doing postdoc or MD PhD students here all the time who then go back to those countries and, and, and set up their own units. Um, that happens all the time now. Uh, might it happen on a larger scale if more funding was available? Sure. But, but I think it is happening uh, to a great degree already. Sadly, those people don't stay. They go back, but that's fine. Uh, might we get more of them to stay with more funding? I think sure. Uh, there's also the issue of visas and immigration. That's a complicated answer that is obviously at the heart and soul of a, of a debate between the American people and, and Congress now. But, but I, I think I, I would hope if, if you build it, they will come, so to speak. If we fund it, we, we will have the attractive uh, programs for students from around the world in the United States to come. The, the problems we're solving are not problems just that we have. They're basically global problems, and that's another focus that Stanford has, is that we want solutions that will affect all of humanity, and in that way we're all alike. So the investments here are well worth making because the scale of our effect is going to be huge. You spoke about uh, correcting uh, like a cleft palate. Uh, uh, how would you determine, find out that there was such a de deformity okay, so, before uh, birth? And, and Dean Stevenson can come on this as well. So mo uh, uh, prenatal diagnosis of anatomic problems, like a cleft, for example, is done routinely. The, 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 the ubiquitous nature of ultrasound or 3D ultrasound or even more sophisticated imaging allows you to diagnose anatomic defects before birth. So many of the patients we get, we're looking at an ultrasound from a pregnant woman. But you might want to comment on no, that. That's exactly the case. I mean, imaging has improved so much that if I'd seen imaging like that um, when I was training, I might have gone into <laughs> an imaging field. <laughs> But it's, you know, it used to be difficult to sort of make out uh, what you can see in an ultrasound. Now you can see basically the way you can see outside the womb. So we know very early that those kinds of defects are present. And, and I just use that as an example, but at Packard Children's Hospital, we are performing, uh, we meaning the faculty, who have been extraordinary in the heart center, even intervening before birth with, uh, with uh, catheters, uh, when it would be too late to wait to birth. There are these ripple effects of not having a valve functioning, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so in those situations, yeah, I think the diagnosis is improving. The scale of the instrumentation is improving. It's extremely complex to treat uh, the unborn patient. But, but in many times, it's, it's the only hope you have. So it's nice to know there's an opportunity there. I'd like to follow on with an earlier question um, with respect to the parallel um, activities of delivery systems considering the geographical area, is Stanford working with pharma and medical device within industry to look at delivery systems for the future, doing it now rather than later? So it's a, I just want to echo what Dean Stevenson said. So uh, Stanford School of Medicine has been out in front on making sure that the influence of, of pharmaceutical companies or device companies doesn't dictate the way physicians practice. 
And that's very subtle. You may, you may have read in the New England Journal of Medicine, one of the famous journals, that 94% of American physicians said that they had some influence, whether it be a pen or a lunch or whatever, from a pharmaceutical company. So I really want to emphasize that we have taken the stand that we do not tolerate that all on our medical campus. So just to state that clearly. On the other hand, we are not going to transform human health without commercializing things. So we recognize that we must work with the biotech industry. We must do startups, which happen every day out of the medical school, where the venture capital money, one third of the venture capital money in the world is on Sand Hill Road, not just the United States. So they ignite startups. Those go out, those become successful in theory, and bring something to the marketplace. So our School of Medicine has a great interest in transforming health and translating discovery, but it's, we are not a for-profit business to do that. We must partner in, in an appropriate way, in an ethical way, with the surrounding industry. And that's a great advantage for us here. We have two world-class hospitals that we'd love to bring new therapies in. Could you comment on the role of patent law on intellectual property uh, in either inhibiting or encouraging the kind of research you're talking about? And it kind of ties into your previous answer, it, I think. It's a very important question. In fact, Hank Greeley, <coughs> who's a professor at the law school with a co-appointment in genetics, um, addressed that in the little article I was talking about. So the question of patents are really important. About 20, 25 years ago, the Bayh-Dole Act said that if you have federal dollars supporting your research, you are free to commercialize that and the government won't reach through and participate or encumber that. That's the spirit that led to really everything in the valley and everything you know in biotechnology. So that's great. In the, the issue with intellectual property is the core about which businesses are built. So there's two issues with a patent that you need to understand. One is patentability. Will you receive a patent from the U.S. Patent and Trade Office? The second is freedom to operate, or FTO. Will you be encumbered by prior art uh, in a way that still you'll get your patent, but you'll be blocked by the use of that? So your question is very interesting, because the University of Wisconsin was granted extremely broad patents on primate and human embryonic stem cells in all, essentially all derivation and use. Well, when they tried, so they have a Wisconsin Alumni Research Foundation, so-called WARF, which administrates that, and that was a problem because in order to use those cells or that technology, you would have to pay a, a fairly large royalty stream, prohibitive uh, in my mind. Now, this is my own view. I'm not speaking for Stanford now, but I suffice it to say the whole rest of the country has rained down on them for pressure, and as you probably know, maybe it's why you're asking the question, that that is being reevaluated. Those patents are being reexamined, which is an extraordinary move. That would be a hammerlock on progress if you had to pay hundreds of thousands of dollars to be able to use this technology, because that's not the spirit that Dr. Stevenson and I send reagents out from our lab all the time. So my answer is, I hope not. And I think those are being reexamined, and that's a great blow to, to break the deadlock on what would be a stranglehold patent, if you will. To follow up on um, your comment that you hope that the, that the uh, research will result in global benefits for humanity, um, what is happening now in terms of collaboration among scientists internationally? Is it more collegial or more competitive? And uh, what would be the ideal situation so that scientists globally can really share information? So I think the world is flat, uh, and the concept of labs working together around the world, is, or around the state, around the country, is certainly happening every day, much more so than ever. Science is very competitive, and breakthroughs are closely guarded. But I think when it comes to translating discoveries, that's where you see people really getting together to do trials, to ask the question, does this make sense? There's a balance between competition, first to publish, first to patent, versus working together. And David uh, Stevenson made the comment of team science. We now have grants that allow multiple lead investigators. And, and it's great. The era of team science, whether it be in your university or with the other universities between countries, is really happening. So I'm bullish about the fact that people are coming together for regenerative medicine. Clearly, no one lab, 
no one university has everything. We have uh, virtually all aspects covered, but we still would partner in with pharmaceutical industries, or we would still would partner in with people in China or Germany, or where, wherever the technology was, and we do it all the time. The world is quite small for us, scientifically, and uh, we have friends all over the world, and there's tremendous um, interaction, discussions, and movements between labs. So there is competition, but there's actually, a, um, I think, a, a, um, a heartfelt um, purpose that you need to solve problems globally for humanity. And whatever we do here, again, the scalability is tremendous, and that's uh, part of what we should all be doing. Insurance reimbursement rates and approvability drive a lot of um, investment decisions. Um, so uh, considering how cutting edge a lot of this is and um, the approval and regulatory process in the U.S., do you think that um, some of the first applications of this in humans might be in the fields of cosmetic or elective surgeries done um, in other countries that are more permissive in a regulatory fashion and with business models that um, have large enough affluent customers to uh, be outside of the reimbursement um, uh, uh, you know, uh, system? So the, the, are you a venture capitalist, sir? Uh, no. Well, the, the concept is an interesting one. How do you make investment decisions, and what are the things that you look at? And I'll just simply list off of these things. So if you have intellectual property, if you have technical risk, is it possible? Do you have proof of concept in an animal model? Do you have a regulatory risk, which the gentleman has alluded to? How do the three initials, the three letters FDA, view this, right? Uh, secondly, or, or next, to, there is a market risk. Is there a market for this? Are you targeting something that two people in the world have? That would be great for those two people, but not a huge market, depending on the price point. If your price is $2 trillion a shot, that would work. Um, is it a big market? Is it an unmet need? And will physicians adopt it? If you're asking Dr. Stevenson and the Neal ICU to bring a swimming pool in and do something that takes 10 hours, unlikely it'll be adopted. So. IP risk, regulatory risk, market risk, technical risk, and reimbursement risk. So this is how a venture group looks at new, new things. So the reimbursement risk is, is there a payer code? Is this going to be a trailblazing thing? And if so, what's the margin? Now, the gentleman brings up a good point. High margins draw a crowd. So one of the ways you circumvent all that on the, on the uh, reimbursement risk is to do it in discretionary medicine. Someone wants to pay. $10,000 to have this filler injected or something happen and they're paying out of pocket, that's great. So you see some of that, but in regenerative medicine, some of the early applications are clearly in aesthetic medicine. But I, I think you know, that's inevitable because that's an early application that circumvents the reimbursement risk. So I think your answer is right. I don't know about in other countries, but because uh, they certainly, I can Im imagine that because personalized medicine and cosmetic surgery or whatever in other countries is a growing way for them to market themselves. Uh, but I would think that uh, the investment community along Sand Hill Road is going to look at all those risks, not just the reimbursement risk and not just the, um, uh, the need for discretionary dollars. I'm curious, you mentioned uh, primate research. Could you tell us what's going on there? We don't have a primate center here. But you said Wisconsin? Yeah, well, uh, so, there, so the, including um, primate embryonic stem cells. But I will tell you this, that there have been successful somatic cell nuclear transfer techniques in, in regional primate centers. And I think, uh, obviously, there's one in Davis and up in Oregon and around the country. So uh, everyone remembers the problem in Seoul, Korea uh, from two years ago, where, well, there, there was a, uh, the concept was reported in the most prestigious journals in the world that you could do what I said, somatic, you could take a, s a nucleus out get it one in three chance, it went from one in 800 to doing it all the time, essentially a 40% chance, and it would reprogram and you would justify that. Well, it turned out that was one of the largest and most embarrassing scientific frauds in the last 10 years. The people who don't want stem cell research to go on said, see, I told you that was a bad idea. So we still, to this day, are struggling to show that somatic cell nuclear transfer is technically feasible and, and easily scalable. 
we're making progress and including in primates. So I'm hopeful, in fact, someone is moving to Stanford to work in a stem cell biology program with great experience in that area. And that is really exciting. So um, to the limits we can collaborate with those institutions and centers, we'd certainly like to do that as a logical step to go from mouse to man. I think it's important to remember that, um, uh, before you thank Michael, I'll thank him too, but um, it's important to remember that uh, human beings are a lot more complex than some of the other organisms with which we work. And uh, we have the reputation sometimes being the best mouse doctors in the world at Stanford. <laughs> but as physicians, we're also concerned about uh, humanity and solving some problems for the rest of us. I mean, Michael, thank you very much. Um, Welcome. Good luck to you and to all of us. Thank you. Thank you. The preceding program is copyrighted by Stanford University. Please visit us at stanford.edu.